everybody. Today is um, a, another in the line of the employee capability uh, webinars. Uh, my name is Simon Gilmore and I'm a partner in the employment team and I'm joined today by my colleague Sean Walsh who's an employment lawyer in our team as well. Uh, before kicking off I'm going to pass you over to Charlotte Smith who's our webinar organizer and she's going to talk to you about our Q&A process today. Thank you Charlotte. Hi guys, so there is two options to ask questions in the webinar today. So the first option is to send an instant message. Your instant message will come through to myself, not directly to Simon and Sean. If you prefer to send an instant message, Simon and Sean can answer your queries directly to your inbox post webinar. The alternative option is there will be a section dedicated to questions and answers at the end of the webinar where you can gain microphone access to speak directly to Simon and Sean. In order to interact directly with Sean and Simon at the end of the webinar, there should be a button on your control panel with a hand icon. If you click the hand icon, I can see that you've effectively raised your hand and then give you access to the microphone to speak directly to Sean or Simon. Right, over to you, Simon. Thank you. Thank you, Charlotte. So as I say, today is the second in the line of the employee capability webinars that we're running. Uh, two weeks ago, a number of you joined us for the absence management session. And today we're looking at performance management. Like absence management, performance management is in practice a tricky area for employers. And one we find that many employers get wrong, either because they don't actually do any performance management or they do it badly. Hopefully after today, with some practical and legal tips from ourselves, uh, you will be better equipped to deal with what, as I say, is uh, quite a tricky area in practice. So what are we covering uh, today? Uh, onto the next slide. So first off, we're going to talk about the ACAS Code of Practice on disciplinary and grievance procedures, in particular how this relates to managing performance issues within the workplace. We're then going to be looking at procedures for managing uh, performance. Firstly, the informal procedure and second, the, in, the formal procedure. Sean's then going to talk about some problem areas that can arise. For example, the common claim for unfair dismissal, where an employee is dismissed on grounds of capability for poor performance. Also looking at um, how you deal with capability and performance issues within the probationary period and the medical issues and in particular disability under the Equality Act uh, that can arise in capability and performance issues such as those we're looking at today. Sean's going to talk then about uh, settlement of uh, performance issues and disputes and in particular the use of settlement agreements and how and when we recommend you use these. And finally, we're going to give you some golden rules to take away to ensure um, some effective performance management uh, that you can take with you into your workplace. On to the next slide. So the ACAS Code of Practice on Disciplinary and Grievance Procedures, uh, better known as the ACAS Code. Um, we've been um, blessed with uh, various ACAS codes over the last uh, number of years. We've, we start off in 2000 and we're currently on the 2015 version. Uh, the code recommends how we handle disciplinary situations at work, covering conduct and capability. And in this case, we're looking at performance as part of that capability issue. Uh, it is, the code is supported by non-statutory ACAS guidance. Uh, a very useful document uh, with lots of practical tips based on good industrial relations practices and years of unfair dismissal cases as well. So uh, thoroughly recommend using that um, to support you um, in any management uh, of uh, underperformance issues. Uh, since 2008, there have been repercussions if you fail to follow the ACAS code. So if you as the employer unreasonably don't follow the ACAS code. This is taken into account by any tribunal in any claim um, resulting from a uh, performance dismissal. Uh, 
and this could go to the issue of fairness. If you are unsuccessful um, in your claim, then uh, you could also face up to 25% uh, uh, additional uh, compensation or compensatory reward uh, awarded against you. So really important that we do follow the ACAS code. What's the next slide? So what are the code requirements, the main code requirements? Firstly, to carry out a reasonable investigation before any disciplinary hearing and before any disciplinary sanction is imposed. In the case of performance issues, this means assessing um, employees' performance, uh, collating evidence showing uh, that the performance is uh, unsatisfactory, such as appraisals, results from KPIs, etc. The code also recommends that investigation and hearing uh, is carried out by different people where practical in a formal uh, performance uh, process. Uh, I would say that um, in practice that isn't always uh, the case and often, uh, as we'll look at shortly, the line manager will carry out both the investigation and the hearing. Now, I'm reasonably relaxed about that where all we're gonna do is perhaps issue a, a warning. If we're looking at getting to the dismissal stage, then I think that uh, we need to be a little bit more careful um, and have probably different people doing the investigation and hearing uh, parts of the uh, process. Uh, before any hearing, uh, it's important that um, employees provide with uh, written notice of any alleged poor performance and also the potential consequences arising out of that hearing and the notification must be in sufficient detail to allow the employee um, to respond at the hearing so they know exactly what the allegations are that they're facing. On to the next slide. Uh, employees do have the right to call witnesses although that's more a case that rises in conduct situations usually rather than um, capability or performance issues. Uh, the code suggests that employees uh, go through the evidence uh, at the beginning of the meeting uh, supporting the poor performance so that the employees knows uh, exactly what the uh, case is against them and then can present their case and their evidence. Where appeals uh, are made these should be dealt with impartially by someone not previously involved where possible. Uh, I think this is uh, more important than splitting the investigation and disciplinary hearing uh, role and it is important that the appeal officer is someone who is different to the person that made the decision, uh, preferably someone independent from the uh, the case and preferably more senior than the person that was the original decision maker. Any formal warnings arising out of any formal process, so any warnings that are on the record do fall within the ACAS code. Uh, the ACAS code does always does also say that it is normal, but not always the case, to have two warnings before a dismissal um, in both a conduct or a capability uh, situation. On to the next slide. So what procedures should we uh, follow um, for managing poor performance? In most cases, uh, we should be following an informal process first and that is not covered by the ACAS code. However, um, where the informed process is not successful or where we have a more serious um, performance issue, then we may go straight to the formal process and that must be ACAS code compliant. A fair procedure usually uh, requires that um, the purpose of that procedure is aimed at improvement rather than punishment. Uh, it should ensure that uh, any concerns that the business has are dealt with fairly. The procedure is not applicable to genuine sickness issues or matters relating to misconduct or redundancy. Many, well, not many, actually some employers do have um, their own procedure managing um, performance issues and that's set down in writing. However, most employers do actually resort to the disciplinary procedure which covers both conduct and capability and in my view that usually suffices. On to the next slide. So firstly the informal procedure. Uh, before looking at that just a few preliminary points. Um, 
many issues arise around performance because we've got the wrong person in the wrong job. And therefore, it's really important from the outset to make it clear what is required uh, in that role uh, in terms of what responsibilities are, what experience, skills, qualifications are needed. And this should be uh, set out in any job advertisement, um, any interview process, and any job description. And this relates to not just new employees, but also employees who are looking to move to another role in the business. I think also one other point, which Sean's going to deal with in more detail, is um, utilizing the probationary period effectively. Many um, employers, in my experience, do not do so. You've usually got a three or six month probationary period for new employees. And sometimes you can have a probationary period for existing employees where they're put into a new role. So make sure with it that we do actually use this effectively and also extend any preparation uh, where we feel like we need uh, further time to assess capability and suitability for that role. Um, let's, let's also not forget that these days employees have to have two years service before they can make a claim for unfair dismissal. And so you've got almost two years, uh, including any probationary period, within which to assess capability and suitability. So we really should be using that time to ensure that we do have the right people doing the right role. Um, just a general point in dealing with underperformance. Uh, my view is that we should deal with it as soon as it arises. Uh, easier said than done, I know, but um, delay can cause problems. There can be morale issues where productive staff uh, see that underperformers uh, are not being managed properly. Underperformers can create health and safety issues within the work environment. And as Sean will highlight uh, shortly, it's much more difficult to dismiss uh, an employee where there is historic um, performance issues which have not been addressed. So, as I say, um, very important at the outset to be clear what the role entails, set out any targets, KPIs, objectives, etc. early on the consequences of not hitting those targets, etc., and make sure that that's followed up with some sort of informal review process and a more robust appraisal process as well. So where we do have um, employee performance issues, uh, these should be generally dealt with as part of day-to-day -day management, so just business as usual, really. Um, it's important where we are having these discussions, and I accept they are sometimes difficult discussions, that we do take notes of those meetings. Um, before having those discussions, make sure we're fully prepared for them. What are we trying to achieve? How are we going to achieve that? Uh, put down a number of bullets in terms of what we're going to cover. Uh, make sure we've got evidence of the poor performance uh, to refer to in the meeting. And then we go through the agenda along those points set out in the slide, so clarify what the required standards are, hopefully reiterating what we've already said in the JD, etc. Identifying what the areas of concern are that we have regarding the employee's performance. Um, establishing the likely causes of poor performance is crucial really at an early stage because it may well be that the employee isn't able to do the role and that is the end of it. However, usually there are some other reasons behind this. Sometimes these are work related, the employee may be being bullied or be under stress, their workload may be excessive, they may need extra resource, or there may be external issues, so issues at home or health issues. So whatever the issue is or the issues that are causing the problem, uh, that will govern how we then manage this going forward. We then need to discuss if there are any training or other needs, uh, other support required, etc. And then at the end of the meeting, we need to set clear targets, realistic targets, with reasonable timescales for improving and hitting those targets, with also some reviews set in uh, that improvement period. So, for example, uh, if you are setting uh, the improvement period for two months, uh, we may be having reviews every two weeks or four weeks, for example. Uh, one question that's always asked is, well, how long uh, should we set as a timescale for improvement? This applies both to the informal and the formal process, and um, it does depend, I'm afraid, very much on the, uh, the role that's being undertaken, the extent of the poor performance that we're looking at, the impact it's having on the business, the seniority of the employee, etc. Usually the more senior the role, the more significant the issue and impact on the business, 
uh, the shorter the time scale we can uh, reasonably request for improvement. Where any warnings are made uh, as a result of any such discussions, uh, because this is the informal process, these are informal and therefore verbal warnings. They do not need and should not be confirmed in writing, but there should be a note put on the file. Uh, because they do not form part of the formal disciplinary record, they are not taken into account in future disciplinary matters. One general point here um, in looking at the procedure as a whole, both informal and formal, is the overall time and uh, effort this takes uh, to undertake. Uh, it's not an easy process and it is time consuming and often we're talking months rather than weeks. So we just need to bear that in mind when we are starting these processes um, and also consider what other alternatives there may be, which again, Sean will deal with shortly. On to the next slide and looking at the issue of the formal procedure. So where the required improvement under the informal procedure has not been met, or we're looking at a more serious um, performance issue, uh, then we resort to the formal process. This is, as I say, um, in accordance with the ACAS code. Uh, firstly, uh, and this is a point which I haven't included it here, but um, often it's not required, is we need to make sure that there has been a proper investigation. Now, usually uh, that investigation would have been carried out as part of the informal process. And therefore, we do not uh, need to carry out any further investigation. But if we do, then we need to make sure that that is done properly and all evidence collated before we undergo the, uh, the formal process and uh, escalate to the next stage of the, uh, the formal hearing. Uh, before the hearing, the uh, employee must be given written notification of this, usually allowing at least uh, three working days beforehand. The written notification uh, needs to be ACAS code compliant, as I've said, setting out where and when the hearing is going to take place, what the concerns are regarding performance, what the outcomes are in terms of warnings, dismissal, etc., who will be sharing and taking notes at the meeting, and also setting out the employee's right uh, to be accompanied uh, either by a work colleague or a trade union representative. Uh, one point on that, uh, regardless of whether the employee uh, is a member of the trade union, regardless of whether you as a business recognize the trade union, uh, an employee is entitled to be represented by a trade union rep if he or she wishes. Um, in addition to the written notification, also enclose any further information or documentation that's uh, been derived from the investigation which the employee hasn't already got. This could include witness statements, although it's very unusual for witnesses to be involved in a capability performance uh, matter. On to the next page then, and expanding on the statutory right to be accompanied. Uh, this has been a statutory right uh, for about the last 20 years. Uh, and it is a right, as I say, to have a work colleague or trade union representative present for a formal uh, disciplinary or similar type process, which can result in uh, disciplinary type sanctions, such as warnings or dismissal. The representative can make representations on behalf of the employee, ask questions on behalf of the employee and can confer with the employee, but they cannot answer questions that are put directly to the employee. They also cannot be disruptive at the, the hearing itself. If a work colleague is asked to be a companion, uh, they may refuse if they wish to, so it's entirely up to them if they wish to. If the companion is not available, then you as the employer should postpone any hearing for up to five working days and to allow the uh, companion to be present. On to the next slide. Other issues that do arise, often we see non-attendance issues, um, set especially in capability and performance uh, matters, such as uh, the ones that we're looking at here. Uh, there are some options which we are gonna look at now where this occurs. Um, if there is no good reason for the non-attendance, then you as the employer are within your rights to hear the um, hearing uh, in the absence of the employee. Uh, we don't recommend doing so. Uh, we recommend allowing one um, uh, rearranged uh, meeting uh, before perhaps doing so. If there are, however, uh, 
um, good reasons for non-attendance and health is usually one of them, then there are other options which we recommend looking at uh, to try and get the, the hearing heard and the process uh, concluded. It does depend very much on what the, the issues are. If we are looking at health issues, then often it's uh, suggested that you get a health um, a doctor's report to understand what the issues are and when we can uh, undertake any hearing and what reasonable adjustments uh, where we have a disability, for example, uh, may be required. So um, examples that uh, I've used as options before include um, allowing the employee to make written representations rather than attending themselves or uh, having their representative attend on their behalf or having the hearing uh, undertaken at a place at or near the employee's home or perhaps having the hearing uh, undertaken by way of phone or Skype. So there are a number of options and the employer is entitled to have the hearing and the process concluded with any reasonable time. Uh, and therefore we should do what we can uh, to try and uh, push the process through, albeit uh, within reason and allowing uh, some time for employees to attend themselves if possible. Uh, it is normal for direct line managers to chair the hearing. Um, as I said earlier, uh, it's also normal for them to collate um, any evidence and undertake the initial investigation. Uh, where we are looking at a dismissal situation, we may uh, need to assess the risks around doing the investigation and the hearing all at once as the direct line manager. And certainly where there are clear personality issues or breakdown in the relationship between the manager and the employee, it would be advisable to have someone else doing the, the hearing. Uh, confidentiality issues obviously arise um, for uh, such um, uh, issues uh, relating to um, attendance, uh, sorry, and relating to performance. And it's important that we comply with those as the employer, uh, keeping uh, the actual existence of these um, processes as discreet as possible. There are data protection requirements, obviously, under the GDPR, uh, for example, keeping records secure and keeping records for only so long as is required. So if we're looking at um, lapsed or spent uh, warnings, these usually should be taken off the file if possible and certainly should be disregarded for further uh, disciplinary matters. Uh, digital recording is an interesting one. Uh, we really recommend you having some reference to digital recording within your disciplinary procedure and whether or not you allow this. Um, if you do not, then make that clear within the process and the procedure, but also make it clear at the beginning of any hearings. If employees still do take digital recordings, uh, disregarding what they've been told uh, not to do, then that could be a further disciplinary and conduct matter. That said, uh, I'm afraid that tribunals do tend to uh, allow um, digital recordings as evidence uh, where they consider that they may be relevant um, and that could be admissible evidence, I'm afraid. So that's all for me um, so far. Um, I'm now going to pass over to Sean to continue. Thank you. That's lovely, Simon. Thank you very much. If I can have the next slide, please. So we're now coming to the aims of the hearing. So the first bullet point there you will see is to set out the required standards that have not been met yet. And this will form the basis of both what the employee is failing to do and what the business expects the employee to be achieving. It's important these standards are commensurate with the role, any job description for the role, as well as any targets agreed, perhaps in previous appraisals or previous one-to-ones. The required standards should not be something unexpected by the employee from a reasonable objective viewpoint. Then you would uh, go through the relevant evidence and documentary evidence here, whether in the form of spreadsheets, financials, uh, production sheets, emails, appraisals, etc., are an important tool, as this is the kind of evidence is, which is normally objective and factual, and evidence is how the employee is not attaining the required standard with little, if any, subjective opinion. And this would undermine, therefore, any arguments as to bias and singling out. Certainly where there is documentary evidence that highlights where the employee has failed to meet agreed targets uh, and or standards, it can be difficult for the employee then to argue that they have been performing to the required standard. And then we've got a couple of bullet points there allowing the employee to ask questions, 
and allow the employee to respond to evidence and present their own evidence. It is important to allow the employee the reasonable opportunity to put their side across, produce their side of events and produce any evidence in support. This not only accords with the ACAS code and evidence is a fair hearing and procedure, it is also possible for the employee to provide evidence to counter the allegations they have not been performing and evidence where they are meeting required standards. Uh, the next bullet point then uh, says about allowing the employee to make representations, examples of explanations and mitigation. Once again, this will evidence a fair hearing. Where the required standards and performance has not been attained or, ma or maintained, it is possible the employee may have a reasonable explanation that you had not thought of. Uh, for example, the employee may be uh, getting the required may not be getting uh, the required information, assistance, or support from colleagues in order to perform their role. It, it may be a training issue, perhaps on a new process or new software or hardware. It may be the employee is struggling to cope, uh, perhaps because of issues outside of work, as Simon mentioned, or maybe they feel they have been harassed or bullied by a colleague or even their line manager. Whatever the employee raises here should be given reasonable and appropriate consideration before coming to a decision. If I can go to the uh, next slide then, please. So then we come to the, the uh, further aims of the hearing. And the first bullet point there is to do, uh, identify any further measures, example, training or supervision. Uh, I've uh, put further in brackets here as it, it may well be further measures as some measures may have already been put in place, for example, during any informal procedure. Sometimes the employee may have just temporarily lost their way, especially if they were a strong performer before. Therefore, additional training or a steer through supervision may be the answer here. Uh, we're looking then at discussing and possibly agreeing targets for improvement. And it's always preferable where possible to agree targets for improvement, as this will evidence the employee believe them to be achievable, reasonable and commensurate with their role and of course fair. However, you also need to be aware of the business needs here and what the business requires from that particular role. Therefore, setting reduced uh, targets just because that's all the employee will agree to will not only have a detrimental in impact on the business, but may also have a detrimental knock-on effect on the employee, employee's colleagues who may in part rely on the employee's performance to the required standards in order to perform their role. At the same time, the targets should be similar in nature to previous targets for the role and shouldn't be, a, 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 from a reasonable objective viewpoint, come as any surprise to the employee. So I would be prepared here to justify the targets and evidence and argue that they are commensurate with the role, perhaps referring to previous targets or to others that carry out a similar role. Um, the next bullet point then is uh, states about reviewing and if possible agreeing periods for improvement. And as Simon said, the review period can be an area um, uh, it can be very important and is certainly an area um, that can be uh, uh, of dispute between you and the employee. In addition, a reasonable timescale for improvement can be just as important in terms of fairness and rendering any subsequent dismissal unfair as the setting of reasonable targets to achieve. It's pointless really setting reasonable and possibly agreed targets if the period set for improvement rendered those targets unachievable. Um, as Simon mentioned, what period of time is considered reasonable will be fact sensitive and is what is reasonable in the circumstances. And it will also depend on the nature of the poor performance and the needs of the business. If I can give two contrasting examples, you'll see how where the difficulties can lie <clears throat> with regards to what is a reasonable uh, performance period here to review. So the first example is an employee on a production line who produces widgets. That employee will have to have targets as to how many widgets to produce per day and in a relatively short review period, perhaps a week, uh, perhaps a week or two, you would be able to gauge if that employee was making the required improvements. If I then contra contrast something at the other end of the scale, uh, for example, a fashion designer for a high street retailer, and they're likely to design uh, perhaps a winter collection the previous spring or even before. <clears throat> 
and a reasonable re review period here would be once the winter collection has gone into the shops and it has had time to sell. It's quite often, it quite often makes sense to link the timescale of a, a part of your, uh, to a part of your business cycle. So what I mean here, for example, uh, for a senior sales employee, it may be a quarterly sales target period, or perhaps for a, a project manager, it might be the duration of a particular phase of the project. Again, it is preferable here to try and agree the timescale as this will evidence the employee thought it reasonable and the targets to be achievable within this time frame. And then the next bullet point there is where dismissal is a possibility. Um, and this is likely to be where the employee has already been formally warned and not made the required improvements. So establishing whether there is a likelihood of sufficient improvement, certainly past performance here is likely to be indicative of future performance. So a review of that and the circumstances surrounding should be considered. You also need to consider whether improvements will be made within a reasonable time. You may feel a small improvement has been made. However, from a business point of view, the business can no longer reasonably continue to support the employee for the amount of time it will take to improve to the required standard. And so if that's the case, it may be that the uh, reasonable and fair to dismiss. I have then put a bullet point about any alternatives uh, and I should, have to, I should stress here there is no absolute obligation on you to consider alternative employment uh, or demotion before taking the decision to dismiss. However, it may be unreasonable in the circumstances not to do so and as you'll see in, uh, when I come to discrimination and reasonable adjustments if they become necessary, it, it may well be a reasonable adjustment to consider alternatives to dismissal. It will depend on the size of your business and the resources open to you. And again, therefore, it is fact sensitive and will be a question of fact and evaluation for any employment tribunal should a case be brought. If I can then uh, move to the next slide, please. So we're looking then at uh, the use of uh, adjournments. Um, the, sorry, um, uh, the, uh, Charlotte, if, yes, so we, we're just looking at the use of adjournments then. Um, I should uh, uh, point out that this is likely to be a stressful situation for the employee and possibly for any witnesses, although as we've already uh, gathered here, uh, witnesses are un less likely in a performance management procedure. If the employee becomes upset or angry or increasingly agitated uh, during the hearing, it's a good idea to use adjournments so the employee can uh, regain their composure. Also, once both sides have presented their case and there are no further questions, the hearing should then be adjourned to investigate any matters raised by the employee and gather any further information. However, even if no new issues were raised by the employee, it is still sensible to adjourn and consider matters discussed before coming to a decision. If new information does need to be investigated, the employee should be given a chance to consider and respond to it before a decision is made. Adjourning to make a decision also allows you to consider the rationale and reasons for your decision, which you should then give to the employee when the hearing reconvenes and you give the employee your decision. So then we come to these stages um, with regards to the formal procedure and you'll see there that stage one is a first written warning. As, as Simon mentioned, the ACAS code recommends that uh, there's at least two warnings be uh, are given before an individual is dismissed for poor, poor performance, unless it is gross negligence or the employee is still in their probationary period or unless the matter is so serious enough to warrant a final written warning. Therefore, the first written warning is usually appropriate after a formal review of poor performance and there is no other formal warnings. Under the ACAS non-statutory guidance to the ACAS code, it is recommended a first written warning remains live for six months. However, this will depend on whether you have an existing capability procedure and the time frame for warnings in that procedure. Uh, if I can move to the next slide. So stage two, is the final written warning and this is appropriate where failure to improve after the employee is given a first written warning within the time scale for improvement or where there is a serious case of poor performance. Again what is a serious case for poor performance is likely to be fact sensitive and will depend on the role and its requirements for the business 
and the factors such as the seniority of the employee. Certainly, in, in my view, if an employee is negligent, and this had a detrimental serious consequence for the business, which was foreseeable, this would warrant going straight to a final written warning. Uh, the ACAS non-statutory guidance recommends a final written warning remains live for 12 months. But again, I should stress uh, this will depend on whether you have an existing capability procedure and the time frame for warnings in that procedure should be followed. And then stage three, uh, there is dismissal. And this is appropriate where the employee fails to improve after being given a final written warning, which remains live. I've then uh, gone on to alternatives to dismissal, and I've already discussed there is no absolute obligation here, uh, but it still should be considered. And the types of alternatives are a, a demotion or loss of status where permitted, transfer to another role, and reduction in remuneration. And that could, for example, be loss of bonus or other benefits, or even a reduction in salary. But all of these alternatives could lead to a claim of breach of contract where the contract does not allow this. Certainly one way of therefore approaching this, if you were considering uh, alternatives to dismissal, is to attempt to get the employee to agree to one of these alternatives uh, with the sanction of dismissal if they, if they decided not to agree to one of them. Uh, if I can have the next slide, please. So then we come to the uh, appeal process. And the employee should be given the right to appeal any formal disciplinary sanction. So that's from the first written warning through to dismissal. Uh, and this is a requirement of the ACAS code, actually. The non-statutory ACAS guidance recommends to set a time limit of one week to uh, lodge an appeal, although you should consider extensions where appropriate. Uh, I should uh, point out, actually, certainly with an appeal to dismissal, that any appeal does not stop any dismissal taking effect. It is only if the appeal is upheld and the employee is reinstated that any lost pay then should be made up. Uh, as uh, Simon mentioned, uh, with regards to an appeal, where possible, the appeal manager should be independent. So that uh, means not involved with the original decision and more senior. Now, this can be a difficulty for small businesses, especially where the employee uh, being performance managed is also senior. Consideration can be given here to perhaps bringing in a third party, or if the business has one, a non-executive director, that's one option. Nevertheless, for very small employees, this can still be difficult. If there is someone as senior as the decision maker, but independent, this can also then be an option, perhaps even for the smaller employees, employers, sorry. Uh, the employee has the right to be accompanied at the appeal hearing by a trade union rep or work colleague. So the same as the normal uh, disciplinary formal hearing. Then the outcome of the appeal will be either to confirm the original decision, revoke the original decision, or substitute a different penalty. And I should say substituting a different penalty may be, for example, choosing an alternative to dismissal. However, please note with a capability procedure, it will be very rare for a greater penalty on the outcome of an appeal to be fair. Uh, the decision then should be in writing with reasons and this given to the employee. Uh, if I can have the next slide, please. So then we, we come to the problem areas. <clears throat> the first of which um, is unfair dismissal, which is probably uh, the most problematic for capability procedures. Now, employees can only bring in an ordinary unfair dismissal claim if they have at least two years service. And issues to be considered if an, if an unfair dismissal claim is issued are, uh, it is for you to establish the reason for dismissal is poor performance and capability. So this is why it's important to have those reasons and rationale at the end of the process uh, have it documented and have that paper trail. You must also have a reasonable belief in the employee's incompetence in their role. So again, evidence as to this documented will always be as, of assistance and helpful in this case. Um, you must carry out a reasonable investigation and usually this starts at the informal stage but will continue through the formal stage and in fact as well as any investi investigation prior to uh, disciplinary hearings, the disciplinary hearings themselves are a continuum of that investigation because you're putting the allegations 
uh, of non-performance to the employee and you're allowing the employee to respond and you investigate any further information from the employee that may, may need further investigation after the hearing, etc. So the, the whole process is a continual investigation. Uh, you must also give the employee the chance to improve. Uh, it's, uh, I'm going to come to um, issues with regards to probationary periods um, shortly afterwards, uh, but certainly where, where an employee has two years or more service, it is important in a full and fair procedure to give the, uh, uh, the employee the opportunity to improve and warn that employee before dismissal takes place. And then you need to follow a full and fair procedure, which is what we're all about today. In certain circumstances, um, a, a dismissal is deemed automatically unfair. Now, these include dismissals for reasons connected with pregnancy or childbirth, health and safety, activities, whistleblowing, exercising rights for time off work, exercising statutory rights, and there are others as well. For most of these, there is no requirement to have a minimum service meaning it is a right from day one of employment. So employees whose circumstances come under a potentially automatic unfair dismissal may therefore look to bring such a claim where they have been dismissed for performance related issues, even if they have less than two years service. This is one of the reasons why it is important for you to be able to justify the reasons for dismissal and is why I always recommend uh, even where someone has less than two years service, that there is some sort of fair process followed before dismissing for performance. I've highlighted there a probationary period and uh, put a question mark there by an abbreviated procedure. Now, a probationary period is an ideal time for you to assess an employee's suitability for the role, as the exposure to claims during this period is limited, as Simon has already mentioned. Uh, tribunals also recognise probationary periods as such. However, I would still recommend an abbreviated procedure before any dismissal. Now, the reason for this is because there are other claims uh, other than ordinary unfair dismissal that the employee can bring. Uh, uh, there is the automatic unfair dismissal, which I've already touched upon, but there are, there's also discrimination claims, including disability discrimination, which uh, I will come to. The abbreviated procedure invites the employee to a formal, a formal performance review meeting and allows the employee to be accompanied. You then discuss the poor performance issues and allow the employee the opportunity to respond. The decision to dismiss at the end of that meeting is then, then still possible, and uh, this is possible without warnings or a period to improve. However, by following this abbreviated procedure, it will point to the real reason for dismissal being performance and will therefore undermine any claim of discrimination or automatic unfair dismissal. So then I've also uh, bullet pointed there the employee medical issue. And this is where an underlying medical condition has contributed somehow towards the current performance. If the answer to the question, has it contributed, is yes, you would then need to consider whether the, con the condition is a disability under the Equality Act 2010. Now, the reason for this is because where the employee has a disability, there are further risks to you if the employee suffers a detriment or is treated less favourably because of the disability. And there are also additional duties on you with regards to reasonable adjustments. If you suspect the condition is a disability, you may need to obtain medical evidence before making any decisions with regards to the employee's future employment. If I can have the next slide, please. So um, when then looking at disabilities is discrimination and what is the definition uh, of disability? Certainly if you have, if you discipline an employee for performance related issues, and notably if this concludes in dismissal, you do risk a claim of disability discrimination. And the definition of disability under the Equality Act is a physical or mental impairment. And that impairment has a substantial long-term adverse effect on an individual's ability to carry out normal day-to-day -day activities. Now in the previous webinars, I've gone into detail on disability and disability discrimination. But what's important here is how it affects the employee's performance. <coughs> 
It may be obvious, for example, someone with a physical disability may not be able to get around as easily or to travel on business. However, it may also be less obvious and quite often, for example, mental impairments are hidden. It's in the less obvious areas that the quality of medical evidence has been held to be very important in cases before tribunals and courts. And the courts under such circumstances are likely to expect you to make informed decisions about an employee's future employment by referring to expert medical evidence. And certainly I would recommend such medical evidence that is sought if it's not already available. If there is a disability, there is a duty to make reasonable adjustments. Now, the duty to make reasonable adjustments arises where, for example, a provision, criterion or practice applied by you, which may well include a capability of performance management procedure, puts the disabled employee at a substantial disadvantage in comparison to those who are not disabled. Where this is the case, you must take steps as is reasonable to avoid, avoid the disadvantage. Now, whether any adjustment is reasonable uh, takes into consideration a number of factors. And these include how far the adjustment will ameliorate the disadvantage, because if it doesn't ameliorate the disadvantage, it's not a reasonable adjustment. Also, is the adjustment practicable? Um, it, there's uh, factors considered with regards to finance and other costs of the adjustment and the level of disruption to your uh, business activities also the resources available to you and the nature and size of your business. So you'll note from that, th these factors, that the larger the employer, the increased scope of any adjustments being reasonable. So what you may ask are adjustments that are reasonable in a performance management context? Well, one consideration could be changing the employee's duties. It may be the employee is only struggling with certain duties of the role because of their disability. However, this will of course depend on whether the particular duty they're struggling with is intrinsic to the role. So for example, traveling to client sites for sales reps and also the disruption this would cause for work colleagues and the business as a whole. It has to be rem remembered that the idea behind reasonable adjustments is that it should keep the employee in work. Therefore, uh, other adjustments could be changing working hours changing place of work, perhaps allowing flexibility to work from home and possibly making adjustments to performance the performance management procedure itself. Now, I should point out that cases in, uh, that have ended up in court uh, have shown us that disabled employees should not be treated as objects of charity. And therefore, it would not be necessary to simply not subject the employee to performance management uh, procedure or disciplinary sanctions as a reasonable adjustment. However, certain adjustments may be reasonable to that performance management procedure. And an example of this could be for, um, maybe allowing someone other than a trade union rep or work co colleague to accompany the employee at the hearings. Uh, maybe the agreement on targets and review periods um, are may be reduced uh, to consider the effect of any disability it may have and uh, considering alternatives to dismissal such as amending duties or redeployment so again you know it could be that alternatives to dismissal is a reasonable adjustment and uh, although alternatives to dismissal, there's no obligation to uh, do this in some circumstances such as where the, the employee has a disability alternatives to dismissal could be a reasonable adjustment. Now the action taken has to be objectively justified and this means um, it's a legitimate aim of the business and the business is acting proportionately. Now the legitimate aim here is for the employee to perform to the required standards of the role and uh, the detriment to the business if this is not achieved. So the main issue here therefore is where a decision to say dismiss is proportionate. Now, to be proportionate, the unfavorable treatment must be both an appropriate means of achieving the legitimate aim and a reasonably necessary means of doing so. So it would be for the tribunal in any claim to balance the reasonable needs of the business against the discriminatory effect on your actions by, for example, dismissing the employee. Under these circumstances, the tribunal will consider whether a lesser measure would have achieved your legitimate aim. So again, 
In the example of dismissal, it's worth considering the alternatives to dismissal, such as change of duties, change of role, change of hours, etc. Uh, if I can move to the next slide, please. Then um, we've got um, settlement. So certainly um, settlement can be considered where there is a material risk of a claim to other issues. Other issues may include that the business may be reluctant to go through a full um, poor performance process uh, instead, of, uh, instead deciding the better alternative from a commercial view perhaps is to enter into a negotiated settlement. Now this may be because the management time uh, and effort involved and the fact that a failing employee is potentially costing the business while continuing to not perform during any procedure. Uh, this has to be handled uh, carefully, however, with regards to uh, how you approach this, as approaching it in the incorrect way can lead to a breakdown of the employment relationship and possibly a claim. At common law, there is a without prejudice principle that prevents without prejudice discussions and, and statements from being used in subsequent litigation, where there is a genuine attempt to uh, settle an existing dispute. However, this can present difficulties for you, especially where you and possibly even the employee would prefer to have exploratory conversations about settlement options before anything that would amount to a dispute has arisen. So there is therefore limited, uh, a limited extension to the without prejudice rule with regards to pre-termination negotiations, which I've also bullet pointed there. Um, so with pre-termination negotiations, these cannot now be referenced in evidence uh, in any litigation, but only in an ordinary unfair dismissal case, and only if nothing is said in those negotiations or done in those negotiations that would amount to improper behaviour. An example of that would be anything discriminatory or where there's undue influence or pressure. The usual way to exit under a negotiated settlement is via a settlement agreement, uh, whereby the employee agrees not to issue certain employment claims for a settlement package. Now, the terms of the settlement agreement are a matter of negotiation, and there will be a number of considerations here, including how big the risk is of any claim, and possibly also the principle that you do not want to be seen to be rewarding failure. The terms of the settlement agreement are confidential, but it must be remembered the employee must seek independent legal advice on the agreement, usually from an employment solicitor. There is also usually a contribution from your business to the legal fees of obtaining that advice. Uh, if I can have the next slide, please. So finally, we're coming to the, the golden rules. Uh, and uh, the first of these is to set out what is expected from the start. So this would be the job uh, description and objectives. And why this is important is that it can be a good point of reference with any uh, ongoing procedure then if, if the procedure becomes necessary. It also then uh, helps you to proactively manage the performance and deal with initial issues quickly but informally, which is also what we recommend. Because by not dealing with it um, uh, uh, proactively and uh, quickly where it occurs and letting it slide, th th this can uh, really provide issues in the future, especially where the employee has more than two years service. Because there's issues of inconsistency and the first question an, an employment tribunal may ask is why now? And if, uh, for example, the employee has not been performing for over two years and only uh, once uh, it, it has got to a certain stage that is then performance managed formally, uh, it, that inconsistency may actually end in uh, the tr tribunal deciding if a claim is brought that the dismissal was unfair. Uh, the next, uh, what we would then also recommend is you resort to a formal process where necessary because after all, it, it, it's, it's entirely possible that the formal process uh, may not work and uh, then you need to go through the formal process in order to formally warn the employee uh, at, you know, uh, in accordance with the ACAS code that should be at least two times before they're dismissed uh, and certainly, as I say, where they have two, more than two years service that should be followed. And then the next bullet point, we do so, uh, any procedure do so within the ACAS code and your own process, um, because uh, the ACAS code uh, um, will be considered 
by the tribunal and where it's not followed it's quite uh, possible that any procedure that you do follow then will be unfair and the dismissal will be unfair and also where you don't follow the ACAS code there's the possibility where you are unsuccessful with a tribunal claim that there's an uplift in compensation by up to 25 percent and then we always we always recommend that you be consistent and reasonable uh, it's at every stage uh, of the uh, both the informal procedure and the formal procedure because inconsistency can lead to uh, 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 claims of unfairness and allegations of unfairness and can sometimes make what would ordinarily be a fair dismissal uh, difficult to justify and then we do recommend you look for underlying causes and react accordingly so if it is a medical issue if it is a disability you need to uh, um, look to see if you need to get medical evidence to see how the uh, um, possibly the health condition is affecting performance and uh, how and if any reasonable adjustments are necessary and appropriate and then um, finally, we've uh, just uh, recommended there that you do consider settlement agreements, but only where appropriate. So it's only really where there's a, a material risk of a claim uh, or where, for example, for commercial reasons, you believe that that is the better option rather than going through what could be a matter of months in relation to a performance management procedure where that employee could still be possibly um, failing in their performance during that period and costing you money. So do please consider settlement agreements, but only where appropriate. Um, so if we go to the next slide. So yep, yeah, that's the uh, end of our presentation uh, to, uh, in today's uh, webinar. I do thank you for listening. I'm now going to pass you back to uh, Charlotte, who will arrange any questions that you may have.